In this lecture, I want to look at adiabatic processes. So I'll remind you where we finished up last time. That is, we'd considered three different paths to get from state 1 to state 2. Because state 1 and state 2 have the same temperature, the internal energy of an ideal gas along these various pressure volume paths is unchanged, but heat and work were path dependent. So let's pause for a moment. I'd like you to actually uh, work with an example just to have some numbers to play with. And then I'll put some numbers on these paths, and then we'll move on and talk about adiabatic processes. All right, well, you've had a chance to work with some numbers. I'm now going to talk about some numbers with the example that we've done. And I'll let you either try to reproduce some of them or uh, just accept, accept that they are what they are and move on. But maybe I'll do the simplest one here. So if I were actually to put some numbers on the process itself, if I were to say that the initial state has a pressure of 4 bar, a volume of a half a cubic decimeter, that's a half a liter, and the final state is 2 bar and 1 liter. And it's good to do a sanity check. Do those numbers work out? We said this is isothermal and it's an ideal gas. So in that case, P times V should be a constant. It should be equal to R times the temperature times the number of, of molecules times number of moles, excuse me. But in any case, a constant. So is 4 times a half equal to 2 times 1? Check. They're both equal to 2. OK, so that works out fine. Those are acceptable initial and final states. Let's uh, then do the case where we have uh, 0.1 mole. That'll just, it's a number to work with. Uh, what happens along the DE path? That's the easiest one, in a sense. Because if you remember, What's the work involved along this first path? It is a constant pressure, P1. What is that pressure? 4. The volume change, delta V, is from 1 half to 1, so that's a half a liter. So 4 times a half is 2. So it's work done on the surrounding. It's surroundings, it's negative. So it's negative 2 liter bars. If I uh, transform that to joules and I use the fact that I've got 0.1 moles instead of using molar quantities, I get minus 200 joules. And because the change in energy was zero, the heat along the path must be 200 joules, the opposite of minus 200 joules, because summing the heat and the work gives zero. All right, so those are numbers. You could actually plug in relevant uh, logs of volumes and get these numbers. You can work out these numbers uh, as well, and I will uh, leave that to your, uh, your own interests if you want to. But now let's move on. I want to look at this adiabatic expansion process. So adiabatic, I'll remind you, what's it mean? It means Q equals 0. Heat transfer is 0. So in that case, the change, the differential change in energy, which is equal, is equal only to delta W, and in fact, Given that energy is a state function, and we've now taken Q out of the equation, work becomes a state function as well, because it's just equal to the change in energy. So if you like, du is equal to dw. Whenever either one of these inexact differentials is zero along an entire process, then the other becomes an exact differential. So that's sort of mathematical, but OK, it's worth keeping in mind. So for an ideal gas reversible expansion, it's going to be the case dW equals du equals CV dt, so constant volume heat capacity dt. And we also know that dW is minus PdV. That's the definition of the uh, differential work. It's an ideal gas, so the pressure is minus nRT over V. So if I equate these things, I get that this heat capacity times dt is equal to this dependence on volume dv. Integrate both of those quantities, the one from initial to final temperature, the other from initial to final volume. And so I get that this integral is equal to minus r log v2 over v1. For a monatomic ideal gas, I also have, from having derived partition functions and figuring out what the molar heat capacity is, it's 3R over 2. 
So now let me solve this other integral, this integral over heat capacity. So I pull 3r over 2 out. All that's left is integral t1 to t2, dt over t. That's the log of t2 over t1. So I have this relationship. 3r over 2 log t2 over t1 is equal to minus r log v2 over v1. Well, let me simplify that a little bit. So in particular, if I've got a uh, r on this side and an r on this side, I cast them out. I'm left with the three halves on this side. So three halves times a logarithm, that's like the logarithm of something to the three halves power. So let me think of doing that. And then I'll have a log of something equals minus a log of something. Let me make the minus a log of something the log of the, the inverse. So instead of v2 over v1, I'll have v1 over v2. Now I have a log of something equals a log of something, exponentiate both sides, and I finally have this simpler form, t2 over t1 to the 3 halves power is equal to v1 over v2. Let me think about what that means for a second. If v2 is larger than v1, this number is smaller than 1, and in order for this quantity to be smaller than 1, raising it to a 3 halves power won't change its sign, it must be the case that T2, the final temperature, is smaller than 1. That's it, smaller than T1, that is. That says that as this gas is expanding adiabatically, it must be cooling. So that's quite important. That gives us a way to control temperature. If we insulate a system and expand a gas within that system, not allowing heat to flow, the temperature of that gas will drop. And so let's take a moment. I'm going to let you work with that concept, do a little self-assessment, and then we'll come back and explore it in more detail. All right, so you had a chance to see the difference between different kinds of ideal gases when it comes to adiabatic expansions. I also want to compare the adiabatic behavior to isothermal behavior. And so we looked at some gas laws in demonstrations earlier in the course. And Boyle's law, if you recall, for an isothermal process is that the pressure times the volume at a given state, 1, is going to be equal to the pressure times the volume at a given state, 2. So if I double the volume, I have to half the pressure if it's isothermal. On the other hand, for the adiabatic process that we just derived for, an, for a monatomic gas where this relationship prevails, if it's an ideal gas, I can replace the temperature by PV. So T2 is P2 times V2, and T1 is P1 times V1. So I've got some expressions involving V1 and V2 on both sides. I rearrange a bit, and I'll get something that's clearly different from Boyle's law. It's not P1V1 equals P2V2. It's P1V1 to the 5 thirds power equals P2V2 to the 5 thirds power. So if you, if you like, then, it's less compression power. With nowhere to dump the heat, the temperature has to rise. And that is a consequence of not allowing heat transfer. And because the temperature is rising, the pressure is going to go up. It's harder for me to compress that gas. So uh, if we did not, in fact, have a monatomic gas, but had, say, a diatomic gas, that would have had a different heat capacity, I would get a different adiabatic expression. And maybe you'll have a chance to see that again later. But that uh, takes care of what I wanted to do with adiabatic processes. I want to digress briefly as we're looking at PV processes to think more deeply about pressure, actually. And in fact, to look at the microscopic origin of pressure. And we touched on this very briefly when we were looking at uh, equations of state and their relationship to partition functions. But I'd like to look at it again with a, a bit more care. Uh, prior to do the, doing that, though, let's uh, insert another uh, demonstration into the course here. And in fact, I'd like to look at the properties of a vortex tube. So after we've had a chance to do that, we'll return to the microscopic origin of pressure. This is a vortex tube. It has no moving parts, but it has an inlet nozzle to which we can attach a compressed gas tank. For this demonstration, we'll be using compressed air and two outlet nozzles, one of which has a centrally blocked orifice and the other of which 
has an orifice that's open only at the center. We've already seen how we can use temperature differentials to induce a gas to do work. Remember the Stirling engine? So, if we contemplate the reverse, we ought to be able to do work to induce a temperature differential. We certainly know that that is true, because that's precisely what air conditioners are designed to do. But vortex tubes are not the most efficient example of an air conditioner, and they require compressed air, or some other gas or fluid, so they're not as commonly encountered. Nevertheless, let's see what happens when we measure the temperatures of the gas exiting the opposite ends of the vortex tube, which we'll measure with these two thermocouples. I'm going to turn on the computer, which is connected to the thermocouples, and it's recording the temperature. There's a blue line and a red line, and you'll notice they're very close to one another. Now, let's turn on the air. Look at these temperatures. The gas exiting the hot end of the tube is at 28.5 degrees Celsius, while the gas at the cold end of the tube is down to 2.1 degrees Celsius. Without going into all the details, the air injected into the vortex tube spins very rapidly, and it does so with little exchange of molecules from the center of the tube to the outside. Since the radius of the rotation is larger for the outer air mass than the inner, this leads to a temperature differential. The shapes of the nozzles cause the warmer outer air to exit one end, while the cooler inner air must exit the other. The effect seems almost magical when first encountered, but, of course, it's entirely allowed by the laws of thermodynamics, with work being done by the expanding gas dedicated to the creation of a temperature differential.